Hello everyone and welcome back to positionspecific.com. Uh, my name's Simon, I'm one of the coaches at Position Specific. I've got Mikey alongside me today. Hello everyone. Uh, and welcome back to our uh, the manager Premier League journey. Um, so what we wanted to do is well, we put an introduction video um, out last week um, and for you, those of you who didn't see it we're just going to run through exactly what we're doing so you've got a good idea of, of how all it works and stuff just in case you missed the first video. And welcome to week one, um, which is West Ham United at home. Sorted. Yeah. Okay, so just as I mentioned, we uh, we put out a intro video to this project um, last week, but we'll just quickly run through um, exactly what we're doing, just, um, just in case you missed the first one. Um, so what we decided to do is, um, because our coaching journey has uh, come to a halt at the moment because of the various restrictions and COVID and et cetera, et cetera, um, we wanted to do a project where we keep engaging with uh, everybody on our channel. Um, we thought this would be quite a, quite an interesting uh, little thing to do. So what we decided to do is we selected a squad of Premier League players, um, totally random, um, from 20 starting uh, squads from the Premier League fixtures at the end of February. So effectively, like all the players that are in the starting 11s for the Premier League teams, um, we put them into a um, into lists, um, and we selected 18 players, um, of which two goalkeepers, six defenders, five midfielders, and five forwards. And um, if you want to have a look at that video, obviously that's in the intro video as well, how we did all that um, and how we selected our players. Yeah, I think uh, when we say five forwards, I think uh, we've only got four forwards, haven't we? Because one of them was a midfielder. <laughs> Yeah, there was a couple of mistakes in the uh, in the selection of players and stuff, but we we got away with it with the midfielders, but not so much with the forwards. But we'll uh, we'll we'll cry, we'll crack on anyway and, and give it a go. We'll be all right. So just looking at the ten fixtures, so same as what Sai said there, we put all twenty teams in a generator and we just picked ten fixtures and they broke up into home and away. And as we go through this presentation, we're going to be focusing on West Ham at home. So with that squad of players and with the fixtures that we've got, um, what we'll do is we'll um, analyse the opposition um, that we're going to play in our fixtures um, from their previous game. So like Mike has just mentioned then that we're playing West Ham this week, um, who obviously played Leeds United last Monday. Um, so we've analysed the game from there and we've looked at various things like systems of play, um, what they do in and out of possession, um, any substitutions and changes, and that'll give us a good idea of how we'd, how we'd approach a game through a week um, into into playing West Ham. Um, usually, what we do is we'd like to analyse two to three games of the opposition um, prior, to, uh, prior to playing them. But um, in this case, we're just going to do it um, on their previous game. And just looking at the weekly plan, so what we've done is we've set it up exactly how we would do it if we were managing, as what probably most managers would do is they'd put a plan together on the Saturday or Sunday, um, and then sit down with their their coaches and their their, their team. And then look at how the how the week's going to run. So what we're going to do is is we're going to do five or six one week schedules. Are we say? Yeah. So we're going to plan for just one game weeks, and then as we move later on into the project, we'll then start to look at, at two games in a week. And what that'll do then is that'll change our plan and and when we work with the players and try to manage their workloads. Within each uh, weekly plan, what we'll do is we'll pick two training sessions from that and then we'll deliver them to you. So as we go through this presentation, we've added four practices, which is two sessions that we'll run through, which will help us leading into the West Ham game. Uh, and yeah, what we wanted, obviously what we wanted to do as well is we wanted to try and make this as, as realistic as we can um, with, with obviously out, without playing the game. So... Uh, we did have the idea of um, rolling a couple of dice to to generate a score, so that we um, we could move from from week to week. And obviously, like because you know the score or result of a game always affects your, your preparation for the for the next week. Um, and um, you know, for example, if you get if you get beat four one or 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 three two or whatever, it might it'll obviously affect how you're going to approach the next game as well. So um, that was the initial idea. What we decided to do now is we're actually going to put in. Um, some scores into a randomizer um, and um, generate it that way just because we thought that you know obviously with with the dice you could get really random scores in terms of like a six five or a five four but you could you won't obviously get a clean sheet as well um, so just to make it a, as bit more realistic as we could we decided to do it in a in a randomizer with with various scores as well so 
Um, but if you've got any questions about any of this or how the project works or anything, um, make sure you, you drop a comment on the, on the video below. Yeah, you see, so Sai's looking after the defensive work as we go through these 10 weeks. And what he didn't want to do is, is have six goals against him every week. So we had to change it. Yeah, I was fuming. I thought, I was like, hang on a minute. If, yeah, if I'm doing the defensive work, I'm getting a clean sheet somewhere. So that was, <laughs> uh, yeah, that was my idea. No, it's probably for the best, I'm honest. Didn't fancy six fives, did you? No, that, that would, uh, that, yeah, that'd mess your week up. Never mind, change it. So just looking at the opposition analysis, and like Simon said before, what, what we would tend to do is, is, is look back over maybe three to five fixtures and try to see if we can find regular patterns within their systems. Now, obviously, we, we don't have two hours to, to run through a full analysis, so we just decided to, to pick one game, and that was West Ham v Leeds United on Monday night. So as you can see there, their starting team was a 4-2-3-1. And then as we work through, because you've got up to three substitutions, uh, we have three extra pitches as you work from left to right. So they only made two subs within this game. The first one was in 73 minutes and it was just like for like. And then the next one was 87, which was like for like. Now, what we would do usually is see if um, when they make subs, how does it change their structure? So give you an example, if we're watching a game and West Ham are 1-0 down, and they bring an extra striker on and go to a 4-4-2. How many times do they do that throughout the season? What that does then is that helps us um, plan for things moving forward. So if we see that there's a sub coming on, we've got a bit of an idea of what they're going to go to, which then can um, give us a decision on what we're going to do. As you can see, as we move on here, we dropped in there, so myself and Simon just had a look at a couple of games just to give you an idea. And what they did is they played 3-4-3 three, three against Sheffield United and Manchester City. Um, and like I said, if we'd have watched the five games before, we'd have had an idea of, of what the systems and what the, what the person, or what each personnel did to change the system. But as you can see there, they're quite adaptable. So we would also plan throughout our week on dealing with, with that second system of a 3-4-3. Three, Anything from you say on that? Yeah, just as like when, when we say a brief look, it literally was like um, a, a brief look of, of teams and how they set up and um, who played kind of thing and changing personnel. So it wasn't, we didn't look at any of the games or anything. But um, personally, myself, like I'd, if I was watching a game like on TV, like I would do that anyway. I'd, I'd make sure like I'd, I'd check on the uh, systems at the start of a game and, and check who's playing and, and the personnel and stuff like that as well. So, um, I mean, one thing I will say here is like, I think like one of, one of the reasons West Ham are doing so well this year is like they do have really good balance in the team um, and um, you know watching the game Monday night as well as like uh, or watching it closely um, than I have done previously like um, I think the balance in the team and the personnel just fits really well so it's no surprises that they're doing doing well this year yeah I think if you start to look at the bench side like um, they've just got different types of players to play in that hat they've got quite a good structure behind the ball so like they're quite solid defensively especially with the two holding midfielders in front and then the hat has just got um, so many options. They've got out and out wingers. They've got inverters. They've got strong nines. Um, they've got fake nines. So, you know, like you say, they can they can flip between systems quite easily. And just like you say, just with that brief look, we just saw them playing a four-two-three-one with a, a rotation between the hat, and then um, obviously having the flexibility to go to a three at the back. So it was just something that we'd be be aware of. Okay, so what we're going to do here um, is we're just going to show you um, how we're going to play um, out of possession and in possession against uh, against West Ham and what they do with their system. So this will be effectively our system up against their system. So what we decided to do, uh, we decided to set up in a 4-3-3 um, and we decided that we would have um, obviously like a balance in our midfield. We'd go with um, one holding midfield player um, and two higher midfield players. Um, obviously the balance in our midfield with, um, with Gundogan is that he could, he could drop and, and be a second pivot alongside N'Golo Kante. Um, we've gone for like an out-and-out -out winger on one side in Dan James, um, and we've gone for a little bit of a little bit of both on the other side in Richarlison. So, um, you know, he can kind of be, be out wide or he can come and be, be an inverter as well, and that will kind of fit into how we'll, how we'll set up as well as we go along. Um, we've also gone for Mo Seller as a number nine. Uh, reason for that is... Um, well, two reasons for this, actually. We had we decided that, obviously, Danny Ings got injured last week for Southampton. He's going to be out for three weeks. So we thought if he's injured for them, then he can't play for us either. Um, so he's on the injury list. Um, and because we're playing West Ham, 
Um, and we did talk about this in the intro video, but um, because we're playing West Ham, um, Jesse Lingard is obviously a West Ham player, so we thought it'd be inevitable for us. So um, we've gone for Mo Salah in the number nine position, which which isn't a big deal really. I think like you know Mo Salah's a top player, and I think his movement beyond like really good anyway, and um, he, he's also very good technically. So dropping in to the midfield and creating overloads wouldn't be a problem either. Yeah, I think just on that there, so what you've just just mentioned with the with the three players at the top. Like Mo Salah always offers a threat in behind. It's how Liverpool play. Obviously, with Firmino dropping into midfield, he's always the one who's penetrating beyond. So we're just going to use him in a central position to offer that threat in behind and try to keep their two centre-backs pinned back. And then you've got the two wide players. So if you're looking at West Ham's right back, um, he isn't attacking-minded full-back. He's more of a centre-back slash right back. So putting Rich Allison up against him, um, it sort of releases some of his defensive duties. And then you've got Dan James, which is an out-and-out -out winger against Creswell, who's an out-and-out -out fullback. So that's why we went for that balance in there. How did you, uh, uh, how did you drop it to the, to the keepers, mate? Um, yeah, it was a tough one. Um, obviously, both, both top professionals, neither of them wanted to be, uh, be on the bench. But um, Hugo's, Hugo's a top man. He, he understood. So he was he was all right, um, but no, yeah. Just I was just going to mention there on the uh, on the on the back four. There's um, no surprises really in the back four. We've gone for um, lefty at left back, um, Menendez Stevens, obviously, and uh, Aaron Wan Bissaka at right back, and then two solid centre halves in Connor Cody and, and Ruben Diaz. And yeah, we selected Casper just because we thought that. Um, well, you'll see as we get later on in the video in terms of how we're going to build, but we thought Casper would be best to. Um, uh, best as a goalkeeper to uh, in the building scenarios we're going to have. So um, I think our, our both goalkeepers, like I think you'll, most people will probably agree that Casper will be the uh, the better goalkeeper to build with. So this is just a brief insight of like the numbers and what we're going for. So you've got a, a five v three, you've got a three v three in midfield. You got your two one v one duels in the wide areas, and then obviously you've got your negative one. So yeah, in possession, uh, what we have been having a good look at, at West Ham and kind of how they're pressed, and um, we'll get onto that later in, in slides. But um, we wanted to um, float between a four-three-three um, and a three-four-three when building. So the idea for this is, and you'll see when we get onto how West Ham press. But um, we thought building with the back three would be uh, would be a good way to go. When we say building with a back three, that will effectively mean we push our right back on um, effectively to become a bit of a wing back. So Aaron, Aaron Wan-Bissaka will push on and. Uh, and become a bit of a right wing back. Uh, we'd slide into see uh, Ender Stevens in alongside Connor Cody and Ruben Diaz. So we'd become a back three with a full back. Um, and obviously, Rich Allison on the side will just drop a little bit deeper and effectively become the um, the left wing back. Um, go for two pivots in midfield. So, like I mentioned previously, Gundogan in this case will drop alongside N'Golo Kanti. So we've got that double pivot to, to build with. Um, and Dan James and Ruben Loftus Cheek would, would effectively become. Uh, inverters um, in this in this scenario and, and create a little bit of a a little bit of a box in midfield and over overload West Ham's three in there. Obviously leaving leaving Mo Salah at front on his own. Yeah, I messed up there, because so I've got Dan James on the left, so I'll I'll take ownership for that. He's supposed to be on the right side, Loftus Cheek on the left. So again, just looking at the the numbers, so it gives us a four v one to build. And, and like Simon's mentioned a couple of times now, we'll go into why we're doing this, but we'll go into a little bit more detail as we move through. We've then got the 4v3 on the second line. And then obviously you've got your negative numbers higher up the pitch. So what we're going to do is we're just going to have a look at the... Uh, how West Ham's defensive organisation looked at it. And we've just picked out um, how they pressed against Leeds United. So just to give you an example here, and we've got a screenshot up at the right-hand side, what West Ham tended to do is stay really organised behind the ball and then set the press with just um, a lone forward. What the lone forward was trying to do was trying to set the scene, force it down one way, and then try to, to keep Leeds locked in, which you can see in the image at the top side. The defensive line and midfield line, they kept it really compact and tight with the two deep pivots, so sliding and screening, more of a, a zonal setup. And then the distances from the, the highest midfielder to defensive midfielder, it's sort of when watching the game back, um, 
it was it wasn't a it wasn't a bad distance from front to back, but I still think there was a, a lot of space for us to to exploit moving forward. But within the game, you know, you can tell that they've, that they've, they've been working hard at this and, and they're really organised. Obviously, dropping Jesse Lingard onto onto Calvin Phillips to to stop him dictating the tempo as well. So, like it like it shows there, just pressing with one forward, set the scene, and try to lock them in. Anything on that side? I just think, I think one thing, like in this scenario, I think like West Ham obviously have got a very athletic like number nine um, in Antonio, and he's he's very keen on on running around. And I think um, in this scenario, it's like it's you know your centre backs and your goalkeeper have got to be understanding that you've you've kind of got to get him to the point where he, he doesn't want to do it anymore. Um, or he doesn't, he's, he's not effective as doing it anymore because he's been played around a little bit. So it's just having the confidence to build around that, that athletic nine. Yeah. So just looking at how they pressed in the second wave, what they did is they had a bit of a rotation between the cam and the left forward. And whoever was in there, whenever they saw an opportunity to press a two, the wood, which then sort of changed their system into like a 4-4-2. As you can see, again, in the image to the right-hand side, what they tried to do is, is they tried to, to get the centre-forward to drop in as one pressed and, and then sort of alternate between the two. What we would try to do is just try to flatten them out and then try to, to get it into to our defensive midfielder. And then as we move on, we'll, we'll show you a couple of ideas of, of what we're going to go after. Say anything? Yeah, just uh, watching the game back, I didn't think West Ham were very effective at, at kind of doing this I think, I think the, again because I think because the two that are doing it like so Lingard and, and Antonio were quite athletic um, the kind of like the they kind of went a little bit half and half was well when they went to press they went but I think the one that came like was dropping on the uh, defensive midfielder was a little bit half and half at times I thought Leeds could have really exploited that um, and I think if they had I think it would have been interesting to see what West Ham would have, uh, have done to deal with it but um, but yeah we'll, we'll get on to how we'll kind of try and exploit it later in the thighs Yeah and I think there's as, as a whole the I wouldn't say there was an aggressive pressing team. I would say they sort of jumped more out of a mid block. Would you say? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. But as then, when you've got athletic players, like it can become aggressive quite quickly, can't it? So yeah, that's fine. And and listen, obviously you could watch the game yourselves, and and it'd be good to get your feedback as well. Every now and again, they did press with with the wide forwards and did press with an extra midfielder. But what we're looking for is just regular patterns and things that we think they've been working on. Um, you know, like football's like such an unpredictable sport that anything can happen at any moment. But we're just trying to pick out key moments that we're going to go after. So how are we going to build against this? So looking at our attacking organisation. So if you look at the bottom left here, we're going to change to a, a back three, which Simon mentioned earlier. And I know some people are thinking, well, why would you go to a back three when you've got your keeper? What we want to do is, is we want to build with, with four. And, and there's a couple of reasons why for this. Um, one, we want to get control of, of their nine and, and really work him and, and try to sort of drain the life out of him, really, so that he just drops off and then we can just get full control. But also, we'd, we'd be unsure on how, how West Ham are going to press because they might try something different. So we just wanted to give ourselves a bit of security and make sure them distances are nice and short so we can move it quickly. Also as well, to add to that, is if Lingard does press, we've still got a 4v2. So this would just be early on in the game, just to, just to see on what they've, they've been prepping for, for this game, on how they're going to press against us. So we're ready for this. Hopefully that sort of makes sense. And I know it could be seen as a little bit negative to start with, but for us, we wanted to just go and get control of the game early doors, try to see how they're going to press and then try to pick them off. And then we'll adapt as the game goes on. I was just going to say, like in, in this scenario as well, as like, you, you know, when, when you've got a team who are doing a bit of a pendulum press anyway, where the nine sets one side and then the, the midfielder jumps and the nine comes into where he's, the space that he's left. I think like when you go to a three, it's like, it's a, it's a good option to try and flatten out that front two. Uh, effectively like see see what they do uh, when they haven't got that that one defensive midfielder to uh, to drop onto um, and then obviously ask the question of the other midfielders around them as well of how to deal with it as well so that's what we and um, that's what we always try and do we're trying, trying to constantly ask questions of the opposition um, in in their press yeah and as, as you can see here on the on the Lex line we've we've got four which are covering the full width of the pitch so you've got the two deep pivots which are playing alongside Lingard and then what's that, what that's going to give us? It's going to give us control of the second line. 
Now, what we're trying to say is, is we're going to control the ball on the first line and the second line. And if they're going to commit more bodies forward, then that allows us to, or that gives us more of an opportunity to exploit space on their defensive line. So that's why we wanted to go to a two. We really want to control the game. And and Sai will touch on a little bit as well because of uh, this will help us out in the transition as well if we do lose possession of the ball. Obviously, you can be quite uh, adaptable with the, the forward players. So if their midfielder does press on, so if we have got control of it, so Gundogan's control in that second line and they do press on, then you can push your your wing back and your wide forward a little bit higher and then start to really put pressure on their defensive line. Now, again, if they don't want to come out and don't want to press us, then we'll just keep controlling the ball and moving them from side to side and try to, to tire them out through that way, like teams like Man City. Anything on that, Sai? Yeah, just again, like you're just asking questions all the time because they're going into the game with a game plan of like, right, this is how Leeds play or this is how we're going to press. Um, and what we're trying to do is we're just trying to ask them questions and say like, well, hang on a minute, yeah, that's fine if you're pressing like that, but what if we do this? How does that affect your press? Um, which is a little bit of a game of chess, but you know, that's for us, that's what the game's about. And that, as if anybody's been watching like the journey, we're just all about controlling the ball and moving the opposition and and trying to to exploit weaknesses. And and that's why we've gone with with that three and the two to try build and get control to have a look at uh, what they're they're going to offer and then and see if we can just hurt them. So just looking at the second press, if you're going back to how they were pressing, so the second one was in a 4-4-2 from the cam jumping out. What we would do then is, is we'd just stick with the 4-3-3 the and just keep one pivot in there and then create that little diamond against the two forwards, which you can see here. So again, so we'd, we'd start to come out with a three, get used to what they're doing. If then we recognise that the cam's jumping, then we would just move back into a 4-3-3 and, and then look to overload that, that central area there and try to get our deep line midfielder on the ball and get him on the turn. If they do go to a one and a one, then it just frees up one of our centre-backs to step out and then fix their, their midfield line. Yeah, I think in this scenario as well, Mike, I think it's like it's important to mention that um, and I'm surprised that like Calvin Phillips is usually very good at manipulating um, a number 10 and a number nine. Um, but in this case, like, and obviously during your week of training, you'll be talking to County about how to manipulate the front, the front two or how to manipulate this press, like even like with little bits of movement. So in this scenario there, if, if Lingard's gone, if, if N'Golo Kante moves a little bit closer to Lingard, that's obviously a big distance for Antonio to cover. Um, and that might, obviously, like Mike has just said, then it might free up our right centre-half to be able to, to get on the ball, drive and, and fix one of the, uh, the wide forwards or their other midfielders. Yeah, I think it's a good point there. So I think one of the hardest things that you can't see, especially from the sideline, and you can only get this by speaking to, to your holding midfielder, is sometimes the press is really good in its eye. Like sometimes yeah. they are pressing and cutting out that pass from the four because we, we've had it this year, um, I think it was against Man United, was it? Where they pressed um, in a two, in, I think it was one of the first games of the season, Si. And we were talking to our number four and they were saying the press was good. So we actually dropped him in onto the defensive line and got control. So it was credit to the opposition. So what we don't know is, is um, they could have been cutting out that pass to, to Phillips. What, what Phillips does like to do as well is he likes to go on the outside shoulder of the press. But because West Ham 7-11 were quite narrow, there was no space to do that, Si. So that's why I think they might have. Um, the, the, that's why they might have struggled to get control throughout through Phillips. Yeah, of course. And like, listen, this is this for us. Like, this is the this is the best bit about football, the tactical battle that you'll you'll have in these scenarios. I mean, like I was watching um, Fulham and Man City last night, and like Fulham really good in the press, but then obviously Man City had lots of lots of questions for them. Um, and it's it's that sometimes that's what it's about. It's about those little tactical battles where. You know, like, can you do, can you keep asking questions? Can you do little manoeuvres? Can you do little changes of positions just to give yourself that little bit more time and space uh, and, and opportunities to play forward? But like Mike said, yeah, sometimes opposition's press is just really good, but you've just got to find a way around it. Yeah, good. So just looking at, like, obviously the next line here, it, it's, a, it's a traditional 4-3-3. Three, three. You've got your two tens and you've got your two full-backs pushing on. What you're trying to do is find that free play and then really exploit um, the space around their defensive line. And obviously, you've got your front three trying to pin their back four. And this is where you can have your, your wide forwards rolling inside and fullbacks going beyond. Or you could have your wide forwards staying wide and fullbacks making the inverted run the Man City style. 
Yeah, I think again, this is like this really questions the um, the opposition's wide forwards as well, um, because obviously part of their press or part of their strategy would have been right. Look, if you can jump onto the centre halves when they've got it, um, then then you go for it. But when you put your full backs higher up the pitch in these wide positions, and then you've got your wide players doing the same, to, like it really asks questions of their full backs and their wide forwards as well in terms of how they're going to deal with it, because um, if they do stay higher. Then you go straight into your fullbacks and your your um, your wide forwards and create that two v one against their fullback. Yeah, and and usually when you've hurt them a couple of times, seven eleven are usually asked to to stay in deep. Then that gives you numerical advantage, the plus two to just get control of the game really, and that's what we want. Okay, so the next part we decided to do was we wanted to look at the uh, opposition's attacking organisation. So what they do in possession um, and what we've got to be careful uh, of um, in terms of like how we deal with um, what they were doing. So we identified um, two main kind of strategies from, from West Ham. Uh, the first one was, was direct play. Um, they are quite direct. They look straight away to get the ball into their front players, um, whether that's on the floor or whether that's in the air. Um, usually what they do is they target... Um, a longer pass into uh, Mikel Antonio, uh, who's always very good at, as we've mentioned already, how athletic he is, but he's obviously very good aerial as well. So um, they try and get it into him uh, as much as they can. Or what they might, what they do do sometimes is they push um, Thomas Suchek on um, past the opposition's, well, past our, sorry, um, our midfield line and, and push him up against um, the defensive line. Uh, and as you can see from the um, the still, uh, sorry, it's a bit it's a bit blurry. Obviously, it was um, in the game was obviously moving at this point. But um, as you can see from that, then this long ball has actually come from the goalkeeper, and um, that's Mikel Antonio obviously dropping a little bit deeper, looking for that looking for that flick on. And you can see by the body language of most of the West Ham players there, you know, they're one of their strategies expecting Antonio to win it, um, and they're already kind of front foot and ready to uh, ready to build on that. I think one thing we noticed as well, um, Mikey, is that. From West Ham's goal kicks, like they actually set up as if they were going to play, and then went a little bit longer. Um, so um, you know we're not certain, but we, we kind of think that's a strategy in terms of um, spreading out um, the the well spreading spreading us out or in this case spreading leads out a little bit. So there's more space in between the units. They've got more chance of if they do win that first one of jumping on the second one as well. Yeah, I think I was just going to mention that say anyway before you did, but um, like I think what they they do is is the drop off open up the space and because Antonio's really good at pinning and getting hold of it or flicking it on it just gives him more space to actually to pin and then the, the supporting angles can get there quickly you just because they know what's happening you can get people like Rice showing for feet but knowing what's happening and turning so it's really difficult for Leeds then to set up in a press to then recover so it's quite clever from them um, and we've seen it quite a bit and we've seen teams do it the other way aren't we where they look like they're going to squeeze out push everyone out and then they drop and build don't they so it's just it's like it's just trying to create um, more space for Antonio to, to be able to pin it um, and give him a bit of a room for error, really. So if it, if it is a bit of a duel and the defender gets a little touch, it just gives him time to readjust and, and hold possession. Whereas if it's really condensed, he's got to be absolutely clean with his technique. Yeah, and as you can see from this, this picture as well, like uh, Thomas Suchek's not actually in the shot. Uh, he's actually up against um, the Leeds' defensive line. So... Um, which is obviously a bit of a strategy to, to cause a little bit of chaos. So in this case, Antonio's dropping a little bit deeper for the flick on. Sometimes it's it's Suchek as well, but equally both as powerful in the air. And um, I actually thought Leeds dealt with this this quite well um, in terms of the aerial battle and stuff. But you can see how it could cause problems for a lot of teams. Yeah. Yeah, and then the second strategy we kind of looked at was um, was their ability to to counter attack and. Um, like I mentioned before, like the balance that West Ham have got, like it's really, and this this can be really effective. And um, like Leeds conceded a penalty um, in the the 18th minute, um, which is obviously highlighted in this uh, in this this picture below as well. This is actually the build up to the, the penalty they got to go one nil up. But as you can see from this, it's I think this was a case of I think Leeds attempted a, a long diagonal pass, which um, which West Ham cut out. Um, and again, like they just. They're just always ready, like in the transition to to burst forward. And again, you can see from the body like body language here how like you know they've got numbers in support and and they're going forward. But this was cut out by the fullback, I think the West Ham fullback, and he played straight into their left forward, which was uh, Ben Rama in this case, I think. Um, and as you can see here, like you know Luke Aylins, uh, who's the lead right back, um, is, um, is is obviously like in the recovery run. 
Um, and Leeds have actually kept three on the defensive line and hold the midfielder, which will be part of our strategy in, in dealing with this. But, but again, like it didn't have to be, you know, a cutout from a long pass. As soon as West Ham kind of picked up possession anywhere in the uh, in the mid mid third, um, they were literally like they were looking to to play forward as soon as possible and and break as quickly as possible as well. And um, and credit to them, they're really effective at this as well. And um, I think they did a bit of a number on Leeds, especially in the first. Uh, well, probably. I think I've probably between 20 and 20 minutes and half time. I think they, they really caused these problems doing this. But um, so, yeah, it was clear, clear strategy for us on the counter attack. Yeah, it's a tough one to, to deal with. I think if you're looking at Leeds, like you said, they say if they're building with three on the defensive line, they usually go to a three and a three, don't they? That yeah. just leaves that just leaves um, a one man pivot. And if the, the second line of three, so Aileen in this is pushed high and being took out the game, that actually leaves them with four. So West Ham have obviously planned to to just get themselves into four v four duels as much as possible on a counter attack, um, and again that that was something that we we looked at and we've had issues with this before and I, I could give you two or three games this year where they've just left forwards on the side and we've had to either take the chance and and keep the overload and try score, um, or we've had to to leave players deep to sort of deal with a counter attack. But so I'll go through this as as we uh, progress through the presentation. Yeah, listen, like for us, this is like, like Mikey mentioned then, like there's, there's numerous times where we've been done on the counter attack and I'm sure there's a lot of coaches out there the same. So um, lots of different ways to deal with it. Um, I personally think it's one of those things that, you know, it's it's quite a, it, it is difficult and it's a bit of 50-51 at times. Um, if you're going to be an expansive team and want to push numbers forward, it's, it is something hard to deal with. So, um, but listen, like always an open book, you know, if you've got any comments or ideas about dealing with the counter attack and stuff, then yeah, make sure you let us know. So yeah, so looking at looking at how we're going to how we're going to deal with those two um, attacking strategies from from West Ham. So this is how we're going to defend um, in terms of our defensive organisation. So in terms of dealing with that long that long ball or that direct play, um, especially from the goalkeeper or the centre halves, then um, and we're quite fortunate within our team. We've got two centre halves who are very good in the air in terms of Conor Cody and uh, Ruben Diaz. So we would like similar to what Lee's did a little bit. We'd hopefully go and get one of our centre halves to go and compete and hopefully win the first ball. Um, just to give them a little bit of help as well, um, we'd get one of our higher midfielders to just drop a little bit deeper as a bit of a screen, um, just to make sure that you know if we do get first contact and if it's not a clean header, we've got that op option to get onto the second ball as well. But um, listen, like um, you know, no different to what a lot of you guys would do out there. Got to have good cover and balance. So you know, we'd uh, we'd make sure that our fullbacks um, come around to cover cover the space that kind of code is left. Obviously, Ruben Diaz will be in there as well, um, and we just talk to our Holding midfielder in this case and Golo Kante just about just about being a little bit deeper so we're making sure that we've got numerical advantage in dealing with that that first initial long ball and the second balls as well. Yeah, I think uh, when you've got a player as someone as as good as Antonio of pinning players and being able to sort of pin them and secure possession, I think it's important that you have that front screen, especially if the the team are, are playing direct quite a lot. So I think dropping in one of your, your midfielders just a front screen really takes him out of the game. The performance problem behind this would be is if they push one of the defensive midfielders further up and around us because that would leave us in a 4v4. So we'd have to be um, ready for that and then probably would have to go centre-back in front, centre-back behind and then you're going to have to use your, your keepers to deal with it because you don't want to drop too deep and you don't want to get your forward in there because you still want to offer a threat going forward when you do win it. I think the other side of this as well, size is like your midfield is a goal side as well. So they can see their mark still, but still do a front screen job. So for us, it's, a, it's an easy thing to, to show the players and, and run through in training. And then on the flip side, obviously dealing with that, that quick counter attack. Um, and as we mentioned before, it doesn't have to be a kind of a, an aerial pass as well. Like West Ham were very good at kind of picking the ball up and then firing it straight into straight into their forward players. And what they did did do a lot, did West Ham, was like they did live, leave two two to three players on. Um, so they're obviously well drilled and they're quite comfortable with, um, you know, like kind of dealing with um, a, uh, in, in this case, dealing with what leads like pushing players on and they were, they were quite happy to deal with um, maybe a bit of an overload at times uh, defensively, um, just so they could leave those players on. So 
what um what we would try and do in this scenario is like that if one of our full backs pushed on to join in the attacking phase of the game then we'd keep our left back on the defensive line so we'd have three on the defensive line and we'd probably um, have someone alongside and go Kante as well so in this case it's, it's going to be when it's dropped a little bit deeper just depending on how many bodies West Ham leave up the pitch um, there was occasions against Leeds where um, the left winger would, would drop with a full back um, and the right winger would drop a little bit as well, which is, if that's the case, then you can push an extra full back on or even one of your midfielders. But if they are leaving bodies further at the pitch, you still want to have that numerical advantage. So we would leave three on the defensive line with our full back and we get two, um, two screening players in front of that as well. So, um, and Leeds did do this occasionally, but they didn't do it consistently, especially in the first half. And that's probably where they got um, done a little bit with the, with the first goal and the penalty. But in this scenario here, it's a case of, um, you know, a little bit of, of changing your mark and, and communicating with your teammates of um, who goes and puts pressure on and, and who covers and uh, gives the balance. I think um, I mentioned this slightly earlier. So if you go back to when I was talking about was building and how we were starting the game of building with a three and then two pivots, I think you've already got this structure anyway, Si. So when the ball turns over, you've, you've initially got your three and your two. So and that's something that we'd pick up on as we as we go through the game. So if we set up in that that three and two pivots when we're building early doors, we'll get a feel of how many bodies they're going to leave on. And also, if you remember when we pushed on Declan Rice to to Gundogan, if that happens in a game, it's fine because you can just find your mark quickly because of coming to your position. So if you're like if you can refer that back to some of how we wanted to build, was also thinking about the transition, and hopefully that sort of makes sense. Um, and, and that's clear for, for everybody who's listening. So looking at the weekly schedule, and we'll put these up every week, and this is something that we as coaches we'd put together on a Sunday. As you can see, we're not going to run through it all. You can you can just have a look through and just, and just pick some little bits from it. A couple of key things would be on a Monday, we'd have our coaches meeting in the morning. The medical team, S&C team would be in there. That's because of injured players. So if you're looking at um, Ings, who's out injured, they would tell us where they're at, whether they're recovering and so on. We would then pick up what our numbers are and then we would start to then plan the sessions on what it's going to look like. So if we're just looking at the afternoon, you'd have your, your meeting, your analysis with a team on, on what we've just gone through with you, but just into a bit more detail if you're going through the squad. And then we'll start to look at in possession and then start to look at out of possession on Tuesday into 11 v 11 game on a Wednesday. And then Thursday would start to look at like team principles and targets. So anybody who's been watching the journey would understand what our targets and our, our principles are around the game. Um, and then we'd start to look at out and in possession. And then obviously on Friday would be coaches meeting again on how things have gone, a bit of a reflection. Then we'd sit down with individuals and the team to go through the of what they've done well through the week and the starting team and so on. And then a little bit of set play work in there. And then obviously we've dropped in here as well around the, the squad recovery. Now this can change from, from week by week. And there's obviously other things that we haven't uh, dropped in here, like the gym time for the players and things. Um, you know, but we can do that as we go through through the weeks and maybe introduce some of the S&C stuff. One bit that I would say at the bottom is the information's here. This is just a bit of a guideline. So it's like medium spaces, big numbers on a Monday. So their, their work rate isn't isn't huge or the workload's not 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 too uh, too much on the players. We'd usually work for two minutes and have a minute rest and then a maximum of 45 minutes. And again, as a coach, this is just a guideline. So you might have the option of doing 11 v 11. So that would be big spaces. But what we would say is, is one, could you maybe narrow it off a little bit or bring the goals into the edge of the 18? Or two, do you just adjust the, the minutes? So you'll see when we're going through this that we won't stick to this fully. There'll be little tweaks as we go through. Some sessions will be medium spaces. Some will be large, some will be small. But what we'll do is we'll always alter the time so we're, we're working, um, so we understand the workload for the players. And this is really, really important. And anybody who's who's working or had the opportunity to work in the professional game, you know, um, the sports science side of it is is just is huge now and really, really important that you get this right so that your players are, uh, are going into a game at 90 to 100 percent on a Saturday or a Tuesday or Wednesday. Anything on that side? Yeah, I think a couple of things like worth mentioning here is that uh, that um, you know, like the, the start of the week on the Monday morning, the coaches coaches meeting with all the other members of staff is like when you're managing sort of teams in a full-time environment it's really important that 
you know, you're delegating your staff to, to all to various roles and stuff, um, you know, just to make sure that you, you're all working together for the, the, the same common goal because nobody wants injured players um, and especially nobody wants injured players through, through training through the week. Um, you know, it's, it's really important that you get everything right in terms of your build up to the games and stuff. Uh, another thing I think I'd mentioned as well is like that when it says squad recovery, that means that, you know, our players will be at home rather than being in the training ground, if that makes sense. Um, Cause obviously squad recovery sounds like we're doing extra stuff at the, at the training ground, but, um, and I'm sure you guys are the same as us. We've, we, we've worked with loads of players and loads of professionals who actually their week revolves around what time they've got off to spend with their, their family and their kids and stuff, um, which is like, you know, professional football, massive commitment through the week and, um, especially with away games and stuff and, and traveling them, um, it's important that they understand and know where that is for, for various reasons. So uh, those, those squad recovery things are, um, are mainly at home with um, or away from, away from training. Um, and then, yeah, just the last one on, on what Mikey said about the, the, um, the, the sports science and the, the distance stuff along the bottom. Um, like I've, I think me and Michael will admit the same, like, you know, going back three, four years, we didn't really understand too much about that, but you know, when you get into it and you you start to understand it and you understand the the trade offs for it um, and the benefits of understanding it, then um, then it's something that yeah, I advise any coaches watching this to get into because um, it really does help you kind of plan your week and understand you know which parts of the physical games the players need. Um, so, for example, in, in medium spaces, it might be um, you know the the longer distances in terms of the sprints and, and the large spaces and then obviously like in the small spaces it's all about the um, the axles cells and d cells um leading into the game and stuff so um i know it's not everyone's favorite topic sports science but unfortunately it's a big part of the game so yeah my advice would be get into it guys and and as i said it's just it's just a tool that you can um you know you, you can benefit from and use and, and get that little bit of an edge yeah it's all about gains in it and trying to get get that one over your opponent and if you can get that right it's going to help you out trust me um, we, we've managed senior team before and when a session's going really well on a Thursday or Friday site, so uh, we'll just keep it going, didn't we? <laughs> Not yeah, knowing sometimes, yeah. more damage. <laughs> yeah, because sometimes, like especially, like, I mean, that particular scenario, it was it was part-time players, you know, so their highlight of their day was coming, coming training and when they're enjoying it, you kind of want them to keep enjoying it. But sometimes you forget that, you know, physically that might be taking something out of them for, uh, for the weekend. So, um, so yeah, like I think, yeah, worth mentioning there as well is you'll never you'll never be popular with your players like um, in terms of anything you do. So um, so don't worry about it. Yeah. So what we're going to do is is we'll always pick out parts of this and then we'll run through the sessions of what it looks like and, and obviously we'll we'll show you some of the team principles stuff which won't be so much focused on the game for Saturday and then we'll show you some tactical stuff that that we're going to work on. So what we're going to do for this one is I'm going to have a, I'm going to go through a little bit of the in-possession stuff, which we've talked through, and then Sai is going to go through some of the out-possession stuff. So anyone who's not seen our session plans, and we have just changed it slightly. So this is an attacking organisation, directional possession game. So this is what we're calling like a leading practice on a Monday. Now, usually we'd work for about 45 minutes. Um, you've got all the physical data down here. So it's a match day plus two. It's a day two recovery. So we have to be aware of the workload for the players. I'm going to work for about 20 minutes. Practice load's medium. And again, that, you, you know, you've got to sit with your s and and, and talk about what you need to do and the trade-offs that you, you go through for the session. For us, we'd work for three minutes and have a minute rest. If we do see a bit of a, the players are struggling slightly, we'd just work for for two minutes and then just have a rest for two minutes. That's that's up to you to, to dictate on how you want to manage your team. Area size is medium, 40 by 40. And then we're just going to use 12 players and we'd have two of these set up. So the idea is, is to work on a bit of shape. We want to try overload central areas, sorry, for the game on the weekend. So what we're going to do is, is we're going to have, the Reds are going to be working from left to right. So they're going to be working from the five to the six. Okay, and then White's going to be working from right to left. So working from the six to the five. As you can see here, we've got a big box in the middle divided into four. All right, this is just a 20 by 20 box. Keep it nice and tight. So you're really looking for, for clean passes and, and really good timing. So I'll explain the session as we go through now. So I'll just pause it there. So in here, players can move around all the four boxes and you've got a 3v3. And whites are just looking to get on the ball, transfer the ball into the five and they get themselves a point. 
what they can do is they've got the two wide forwards, so they've got the 7-11 outside the box. Now, they can come into play, but you can only have one coming. So they're looking for opportunities to roll in from the side and then exploit spaces to see if they can receive the ball to go forward or pin one of these players to allow the holding midfielder to get on it. So as you can see here, they've played back and they've got through, so that would be one point now to the Whites. Now what will happen is the Reds will then look to get in possession and then transfer the ball to the six. And Whites are just trying to find the mark. And then you've got the 7-11 for, for the Reds who are then looking for opportunities to, to roll in. Now if you go back to the tactics that we talked about earlier, there where we wanted to play with two pivots and then bring in either one of the wide forwards, this is where you can get your work in. But this is just an exercise which will explain to the players, which is using a couple of concepts that we want to use for the Saturday. So as you can see here, you've got your two pivots, attacking midfielder, and then your seven rolling in. Now, if you've got more numbers, you could introduce the fullbacks who could then operate in these wide areas. So you might get one to step into a wide area here. That's for you if you've, if you've got more numbers. But hopefully that gives you an idea of what the drill is. And it's just a leading practice focused around creating that box with our hat players. Again, just looking to the right here. So some of the individual outcomes, so our performance wheels. If you've not seen our performance wheels, make sure that you, you check out the journey. And I think it's video one. What, what myself and, and Simon and the other coaches, we, we've put together performance wheels, individual and team. So again, what we're saying to the players here is scan, move, receive, release, why they're working through, through this drill here. So it's a real individual focus that we're going after in here with a tactical element. So looking at the, the next stage now, so still focusing on trying to create that box. Now, what we'll do is, is we probably wouldn't use all the structures within this um, practice, but this will just give you an idea of how you develop it. So we're now going to look at 11 v 11, but we've brought the goals in so the distances are shorter and a lot of bodies on there. So we're keeping that workload down. We're going to work at 24 minutes, three minutes, one minute rest, and we're going to do that six times. And obviously it's a large area. Okay, and we're going to go with 11 v 11. We now change the uh, performance wheel, so it's shape, support, speed, supply, so you can have a read of them if you want to pause the video. And this is the game here. So whites will always start with the ball. So when the ball goes dead, we'll always restart. So it's a slow walk back in, and then we'll restart from, from the whistle, but from the keeper. We've put an offside line in here, and then in the middle, if I play the video, you'll see we've added that box shape again in there. Should pop up any second. There you go. And obviously what we're trying to do um, for West Ham is really try to, to get control in these areas. So can we get through West Ham and can we get round and over them? So just give you an idea here. So structure one. So this is the one that we're going after. So the left fullback comes in as a back three, so which we showed you. So can we get control of this nine and then look for opportunities to play through and around or over? And then you've got your two pivots here and then you've got your attacking midfielder and then your wide forward rolling in. So that'd be structure one. And then we'd give them an idea of how to do this, but it's not something that we're going after for, for the game. Just to show you now. So this is another way of getting that same shape, but something that we're not going to go after but we, we still want to show the players and we still want to run through it because this, is, this could be something that we'll use maybe moving forward over the next three or four fixtures. This is just showing that the four can go left or right, doesn't have to always be central, but you've still got that line of three. So obviously the game plays. Objective for the, for the whites is to, to use all the link passes, try to draw out the reds within the structure that you're going after and then scoring the goal. And then just remember that we've dropped the offside line in here. This just gives you an example here of some of the pitches that we're going after. So you've got control on the first line. You've got your spare body on the second line. If they jump out, you've then got space on the next line. And that's the beauty of the structure. If they jump out from the defensive line, then we're looking to break that line. So not losing sight of that one direct ball can hurt the opposition 
and we can get into their goal a lot quicker. So not losing sight of playing direct if it's on. So they're the two sessions that we, we would work on on the Monday to give the team an idea of what we're going after. And then as we move into the 11 v 11, then these are some of the stuff that we'd want to see within the game. And we'd have it camcorded and we'd break the game up into, into maybe six parts where we can go in and coach on the field or pull them in and talk to them around it. And this is what we'd be going after. If there's any questions around this or anything that you, you, you've seen that you, you would change, then just make sure that you leave your comments below and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. Okay, so moving from uh, moving from an in possession day on a on a Monday um, on a Tuesday, we'd then look to deal with um, how we're going to deal with uh, West Ham's strategies in possession. So that will be us obviously working out of possession. So on the Monday morning, uh, Tuesday morning, we'd go for um, we'd use a, a dealing with direct play session, um, which is um, obviously front to back pressure um, and good numbers around the ball to secure. Obviously, first contact on the first one, and uh, dominating that second ball as well if we can. So it's a little simple session we've we've set up to to do this. Okay, so like um, like Mikey mentioned previously, like down the left hand side of the page, we've got all the physical outcomes. So obviously this is a match day um, plus three. Um, so we you know we're looking at doing this session for around 20, 20 to twenty four minutes. Um, it's a medium load again, uh, work ratio of of six. So we break the game down into. Um, into six, six, six times four minutes, um, and then we look at working three minutes on um, and recovery of a minute, um, so that the players are, are constantly like um, working, but then obviously getting a good rest in between as well. Um, larger area this time compared to what Mikey was working over. Um, so this is obviously a penalty area, full uh, for penalty area to um, to full length and full width as well. Um, and we've got an offside line in there, and we're using twenty two players, and it's an, it's eleven v eleven. Um, I think one of the good things to mention around this is in terms of the physical outcome is that because you've got so many breaks in play and the minutes are quite short then the players shouldn't get too too much um, too much fatigue in this um, and plus as well as like when you work in large medium to large areas as well they're getting a good uh, a good um, rep of um, longer distance um, sprints and, and runs as well so dead simple um, dead simple little game so um, there's obviously um, it's the area is split there um, into um, a couple of zones in one half of the pitch um, and obviously a larger zone in the second half of the pitch. And um, the game starts with the Reds goalkeeper and the Reds, the Reds goalkeeper will play out into the centre-backs um, here in, in their little zone, um, which the runner posed in there. Um, the white players can't go and press them. Um, and it just gives them the opportunity to get the ball under control. And then they're looking to play a direct pass um, onto our defensive line and up towards their, uh, their forward line. Um, and what we're looking for our players to do is, you know, can we go and compete and win the first ball? And then can we anticipate and jump on the second ball? Um, I think it's worth mentioning here as well that, you know, as we get later on in the week, when the loads start to become less and less and the, and the areas get smaller, we do a lot of unit work and position specific work around dealing with this scenario as well. But um, like I said, it's, it's, it's dead simple game. So the ball will go into the two red centre halves, play a longer pass onto the uh, White's defensive line. White's look to win it, win the second ball. As soon as that happens, it becomes a normal game um, and you kind of play to a finish or the ball goes dead. Once the ball goes dead, obviously start again with the Reds goalkeeper. Um, but like Mikey mentioned before, like looking at team outcomes in terms of terms of this and defensive organisation, um, obviously like desire is a big one um, about going and winning that first ball. And then if you're a supporting player, can you get around there, um, around that first contact and win the second one? Um, we're looking to obviously deny the opposition opportunities to progress. So that's why it's important to, to win the first contact and win the second second ball as well. Um, if we can't quite do that, then, you know, we're looking to deflect the opposition and force them wide. Um, and then obviously we'll come across the pitch and, um, and have vertical compactness. Um, and then obviously the last thing um, is to win the ball um, cleanly and set up an attack uh, for ourselves. Um, but as I said, like, you know, real emphasis in this one of, of dealing with that first initial pass, um, whether it be a header or, um, or first contact on the ball going into the number nine, into his feet or into his chest. Um, and then obviously getting the players around that to, to jump on the second one. Perfect.
so that'd be the morning session on the Tuesday and then on the afternoon on the Tuesday we would just do a little practice in terms of again defensive organization but this time dealing with with West Ham's counter-attack threat so again physical outcomes down this um down the left-hand side, pretty much more or less the same in terms of practice duration, practice load, work ratio, um, slightly smaller area um, this time. Um, but in terms of numbers, we'd, we'd, we'd be doing this in a, in a 9v9 uh, with 18 players. Um, so we'd have some resting players, but as the practice goes on and as you'll see part of progression is obviously to bring those players in and make it into an 11v11. Um, so again, dead simple little game. What we're trying to get into this game though is like a little bit of... Um, transition as well so whenever you we've mentioned this before in, in previous videos whenever you're working in transmission uh, transition especially defensive transition it's always really important that your team starts in possession so in this case um, the first little bit will be unopposed so goalkeeper would throw out to one of the full backs in this case the right back um, he'd take a touch beyond the opposition's um, left winger first across the halfway line and then he's looking to to, to join in and, and make an attack um, in this case with uh, with five players against um, uh, against the red six so what we're looking for here is like as is, is just as once this attack ends or whatever happens here in terms of like in this case the reds win it then the opportunity for the reds to play straight into the opposition uh, to their to their forward line and then we're looking at our uh, the rest of our players um of dealing dealing with that counter attack so like we mentioned in the in the strategy we would keep our um, our opposite fullback in the defensive line as a three um, and in this scenario, in this game here, to start with, we just have one defensive midfielder um, against a front three and, a, um, and an opposition's number 10. Um, so it'll be a bit of an extreme scenario to start with. Um, and obviously it'll be um, a case of uh, communicating together and, and moving together and, and changing the mark um, a little bit. And then as the game goes on and you progress, you can make it 11 v 11 or you can add that second pivot midfielder in there as well, um, just to be able to deal with... Um, deal with that counter-attack and have numerical advantage. And again, team outcome, same as before, um, of desire, deny, deflect um, and defend. Anything you want to add to that, Mikey? No, I just think it's, I think you've sort of covered most of it anyway, Sai, si, there. I think for you as coaches, it's just how you want to adapt to it. Every, every drill that we've got, you know, we, we've seen it somewhere and we've just adapted it and we sort of get to a level where we started to create our own. So just as long as this is, is clear to you on what we're trying to, to go after for, for the game, and just try to, to get the players in the right mindset and making sure that the, the messages are really, really clear. So when it comes in uh, to the game on the Wednesday in the 11v11, we can really see if the players have, have, have took this on board. And then if we haven't took it on, or they haven't took it on board, then we'll maybe start to, to run through it a little bit again on that Thursday and Friday, won't we say? Yeah. But like, like you said, I mentioned before, um, we, we have a lot of position-specific work. And, and if it's something that we really struggled with, like I say, in the 11v11, then we'd just tweak the position-specific work and maybe go into unit work and, and really like hit home on, on this. Um, and usually if you're working with good players, you know you only usually have to tell them once or twice and, and sort of get, get what you're going after as long as your message is clear. I think one thing just to add to that, Mikey, as well, is like that... Um, you know, you, we've kind of got to a point where we're quite clear with our language as well. Um, and I think you'll see that from a lot of the videos that we've we've done already. And and the coaching journey is that like we've, you know, nailed our language down. So, and it's just, it, for us anyway, it's like a really important um, part of the puzzle just to make sure the players are hearing the same things over and over again. And they become accustomed to your language and obviously understand the meaning of the words and, and how it relates into a game as well. But yeah, language is, language is a big one for us. Okay, guys, so we've come to that point in the video uh, where it's the moment of truth. Um, so we're going to see if all our hard work through the week has, has paid off and we've got a positive result. Um, listen, like one of the reasons why we love football, I'm sure, is like you guys will be in the same position. Uh, I think me and Mikey have had weeks where we've, we've prepped unbelievably well um, and then lost a game. So anything could happen because we've also had weeks where it's been a bit fragmented um, and uh, like a little bit all over the place, you know, due to certain certain factors and then we've we've got a positive result so um, there's no magic formula guys but um, we do like to try and prepare the best we can for games and stuff so and listen like one of the reasons why we wanted to make sure that we had a result was that you know because a result will affect how we prepare for the next game um, in terms of winning losing goals conceded all that sort of stuff so um, it's important for us that we do have a, a result for these for these games that we're prepping for. Um, and what we decided to do as well is like, like I mentioned earlier in the video, we were going to roll a couple of dice um, to, to get a result, but 
we thought that would be a little bit random uh, because obviously with a dice you could get a 6-4 or a 6-5 result um, and likewise you'd, you'd never get a clean sheet um, and as we talked about before like um, I was particularly working on the uh, on the defensive side of a game so um, uh, I dug meals in and, and wanted a clean sheet so, um, so yeah so we decided to do it this way instead so got another randomizer um, we've put in 14 results um, that we'll think would be effective for us to, to move forward into the next week so uh, we've got five uh, winning results for um, the home team uh, we've got four draws um, and then five winning results for the away team as well. So, um, yeah, here we go. Moment of truth. So the result for our first game against West Ham in week one of the uh, the manager, the journey, or the Premier League journey, is 2-1 win. Get in there, Mikey. Uh, I knew we'd worked hard enough, mate. I knew we'd, uh, I knew we'd find a couple of solutions to, to break down West Ham. So, brilliant, great start. Um, yeah, so obviously, guys, um, like as I mentioned before, it's important we had a result just to just to move into the next week. But um, obviously, it's uh, also always nice to start off with a with positive result. Um, listen, com- completely getting carried away. I literally think we've think we've done four weeks work and actually won the game. Losing my mind a little bit, but I suppose that's what lockdown does to you. So, um, but yeah, anyway, um, brilliant. I look forward to to going uh, moving moving forward for next week against Crystal Palace now with a positive result. Okay, guys, that's uh, that's pretty much um, pretty much it for this week. Uh, we hope you enjoyed um, the manager Premier League journey. Um, like we always say, like guys, if you like the video, please make sure you give a like rating. Um, if you've got any comments or questions or anything, like it's it's really important to us that you guys um, get involved and interact because um, that's part of the part of why we do it. Really, um, is to is to talk to other coaches and um, and learn from them. Um, you know, hopefully, as, as as you learn from from us, um, it's always, it's always a two way street. We don't know everything, so yeah, be uh, it'll be great to to hear your feedback. Um, next week, um, we were playing Crystal Palace away, so um, it'll be um, interesting to obviously factor in the the away away game um, and how it affects you each week and how you work and you travel and, it, and stuff like that. So, and obviously, Crystal Palace can pose a completely different. Um, plan or uh, a strategy to what to what West Ham did. So, um, so it'll be interesting to have a look at their game from this weekend and and see what we'd uh, we do to break them down. Yeah, just I think if you sort of nailed it there, Si. I think thank you again for for everybody for for taking your time and, and watching these videos. It means a lot. You know, it's, we just started. This is just a little project, and we're getting more and more people following us. So, if you haven't yet subscribed, make sure you do subscribe because we've still got near enough forty odd percent people who are watching. Um, it just shows uh, your love to the channel. And listen again, like Sai said, just just drop your comments in there. There's no right or wrong, you know. So just just throw whatever comes to your mind, and, and we try to get back to everybody if we can. If you don't want to put it on the comments, then just drop us a, a private message on, on one of our social media platforms. Just want to say thank you again, and we'll see you next week.